isn't isn't it stunning to think that if there, there were some philosophical things that maybe we saw a little differently. So instead of trying to work those things out like normal human beings would do, you know, we really value what you did here. You performed well under adverse circumstances. The team shows a level of toughness and there's respect and there's admiration. But there are some some minor philosophical issues on which we don't see eye to eye, and we believe that the only appropriate way to deal with issues like that is to fire you. I The, the nonchalance, it reminds me of Matt Rule when he was talking about the firing of Joe Brady. He's like, well, you yes. know, we just needed to make, yeah, it just, you know, instead of trying to work it out with the people you have, people to whom you have committed millions of dollars, you just tell them to get out. It, 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 I don't know whether this is part and parcel of, the fact that they constantly fire players because that's what football teams do. They get numb to it. What do you do? You're going to have 90 guys who are employed by you to be football players. And then Labor Day weekend or right about that time, a few days earlier now, so people can actually enjoy Labor Day weekend in the NFL, they fire 37 of them. And I know there's a step before they get there, but by the end of August, 37 out of 90 guys will be fired. And then it's a constant churn all year long. This guy's fired. That guy's fired. This guy's hired. That guy's fired. And I don't know if the ease with which general managers do that with players makes it easier to do it with coaches. I don't get it. I don't understand it. And and I don't buy it at the end of the day. I think that everything that that guy said today is bull bleep. Thank you. I think that they're lying. I think they hired David Culley with the plan on firing him after one year. I don't buy any of what Nick Casario said. He did a great job of feeding us a line of BS today with a straight face. Well done. Congratulations, Nick. But I, I just don't I, I don't believe him. I don't believe him. And he may not like that. I don't care. I don't believe him. It doesn't add up to me. Because if it really did come down to some minor philosophical differences, normal human beings would work them out and keep a valued employee on the team as the coach. Well, especially after they went through all that they went through in the offseason, they deconstructed that roster, and he still won the same amount of games that the 2020 team won. All right? I mean, this team, yeah, it went 4-13, and 13, but let's just talk about some of the things that happened over the course of the season. And I think you can start with Davis Mills' development over those last five games. I mean, he completed 68% of his passes, just over 1,250 passing yards, nine touchdowns, two picks, passer rating, over a hundred. Those are very good, solid numbers. And that I think you can impartially attribute to David Culley because he was there. You know, he had, uh, Davis Mills had 300 yards, three touchdowns against the Texans in week 18. They were fighting. They made the Texans truly earn that number one overall seed. So I think, you know, Casario said a lot without saying anything at all today, right? And I kind of agree with you that a lot of this is BS. We can say that the Texans are dysfunctional, but I, I frankly believe that this is exactly the way they wanted the season to function in that, you know, you just kind of get through it. You know, you let David Cully do whatever he's going to do and you get rid of him. Frankly, he probably overperformed the level that they thought that he was going to. And now it's like, oh, well, well, we kind of have to justify getting rid of this guy because even though you could say, you know, they only won four games, like it was one of the worst rosters in the NFL. I mean, again, these guys beat the Chargers when they had so many dudes on the COVID list and Justin Herbert's still playing. I mean, there's just, there's not much you can say other than this is clearly some sort of plan that they already had. And David Culley didn't really have much of a chance. And I'm surprised that they ultimately went through with this plan because Nick Casario really? was able, well, I, 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 the reason I started to go the other way was because David Culley allowed Nick Casario to be head coach puppet master. Uh, unless Nick Casario just doesn't like that. Maybe he felt like he had to do it. You know, for years, Nick Casario in New England had a headset on game days. He did not have a headset to speak. He had a headset to listen. Now, if someone would ask him a question, he would answer it, obviously. But he didn't have it as a proactive measure for him to contribute to the discourse among the coaches. With the Texans, he was involved. He was in David Culley's ear. He was telling David Culley, along with Romeo Cornell, who uh, had been the interim coach last year and and uh, is no longer on the staff per se, but he's a senior advisor. They were they were helping David Culley. They were actively involved. And 
you know, if you have a coach that, you know, really any other coach is going to say, no, 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 that's not how it works. You don't tell me what to yeah. do. You either let me coach the team or, or you don't let me coach the team. So that's when I started to think that maybe they would give this Cully thing a try, that maybe they were wrong, that maybe Cully had overachieved, that maybe their plan, you know, the dysfunctional team that comes up with a functional plan finds out its plan was dysfunctional because David Cully ended up being better than we thought. There's a premise of a bad movie in here somewhere where, you know, it's almost like Major well, League. Major League. About yes, your exactly. Cleveland Indians, right? <laughs> yeah, we, exactly we, 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 are, we are hiring David Culley with the plan that he will be horrible, that we'll have the first overall pick in the draft, and that we'll go hire somebody else next year after we begin the more meaningful process of rebuilding this organization. But we don't want to win this year. And then all of a sudden, David Culley starts winning football games, and maybe they change their plan to say, hey, we got a decent coach here. Let's keep him. I, I just – I, I the whole thing to me stinks, and uh, and you know somebody raised the question. Well, you know Nick Casario is really taking a chance here because you only get to hire two general managers, or general manager only gets to hire two coaches before he's on the hot seat. I don't know this one counts. I think it was a mulligan. I think it was a red shirt year for everybody, and David mm-hmm. Culley was the the personification of the red shirt that Nick Casario and Jack Easterby wore. Yeah, I, no, I totally agree with you on that. I mean, what evidence is there to say that Cal McNair would get rid of Jack Easterby and or Nick Casario just because this next head coach doesn't work out? I I, I don't really buy that. Um, just based on what we've learned about that organization and the way things are functioning in the last year, year and a half or so, I just I I don't think that that's going to be the case. I mean, the bottom line is. And I mean, I've pissed everybody else off this week, so I'll go ahead and say it. Cal McNair is the Sultan. Jack Easterby is Jafar, plain and simple. And until the spell is broken by someone, that Cal McNair stops listening to Jafar, Easterby's going to run that show. Whoever Easterby wants to be the GM is going to be the GM. And if Easterby decides at some point Casario is not the guy, you know what's going to happen? Casario is not going to be the guy anymore. I think Easterby sure, yeah. is the guy who who realized once he really started taking a lot of public flack last year, when people started to, to scratch and look at his background and, you know, some reports started to come out about his ways and his shtick and he, he, he got the smart. Up comedy he disappeared. Routines and all that stuff. He disappeared. He kept right. Seeing, yeah. yeah. He, he disappeared. He, he knew mm-hmm. the only way to survive was to assume the lowest profile possible, and that's what he's done. But he's done it, and it's worked. And, and I think he's ultimately the puppet master. He's ultimately the guy in charge of the Texans because he has Cal McNair under his spell. And uh, Texans fans, sorry, but this is how it works. This is how it works. You can't fire your owner. You just got to deal with it until he decides to hand the reins to somebody else in the family or sell the team to someone else. Hi, I'm Mike Tirico, and thanks for watching. Make sure to hit subscribe for the latest news and highlights from NBC Sports.